welcome directors Alyssa Namias and Ben Murray. Is there any you know, new developments uh, since the time you finished? There hasn't been any new, con any more construction or restoration happening. I mean, little things here and there, but not just maintenance more than uh, any kind of preservation. But um, right, we were just in Havana. We, we premiered the film at the Havana Film Festival. We weren't sure if they were going to show it or not, and they did. And it was full houses the whole way through. And Vittorio and Roberto were both there. And Vittorio announced that he is trying to set up a foundation in Italy uh, with a, a Cuban ballet dancer named Carlos Acosta. So they're trying to set up something, because if it's not a US institution or foundation, it could potentially help. So we're hoping. Yeah, and I think it's a good point that the World Monuments Fund really wants to help. And from the Cuban side, they would. Uh, there's nothing really stopping the funds. So it is a matter of the embargo for now, as far as that goes. So um, I mean, even Norma, we were uh, screening for her. She was to the last New York screening. And she was saying they're still very interested in helping with the restoration, if and when they're able to. Can you share any more details about what that screening was like in, in Havana? It was so emotional uh, for us to sort of have that homecoming and for the audience. Do you wanna? Yeah, uh, like, I mean, for us, it, I think it was a matter of, like, the, the building stood for this metaphor for the res revolution, but and screening there was completely terrifying because here's the, like, we're showing Cuban history to Cubans, so it was very <laughs> nerve-wracking. But um, I think afterwards it was such an emotional response that it was very much that they saw it as metaphor for, the, for their lives, for many of them. So it was a really great uh, emotional and positive, overwhelmingly positive experience. How did you get permission to film? Well, on, on the U.S. side, um, there are specific and general licenses, and I won't get into all the nitty-gritty of it, but, um, but you just have to have qualify in certain ways to be able to travel to Cuba under the U.S. embargo. And then on the Cuban side, um, it, the, at the time, the buildings were under the auspices of the ministry. Since Fidel had said, this is my girlfriend, basically, <laughs> protect her, um, the Ministry of Culture and the State Department um, were in charge of that, but by, by being with the architects, we were able to meet the people that and, and sort of win them over over a long time. A little bit of luck and a lot of uh, giving. I think they gave us much ac tons of access, but it took us also giving them, we gave them footage of the schools just so they could see what we were up to, that it, this wasn't some very critical piece in many ways. They could see that we weren't just going to zero in only on the parts of the structures that were falling apart. So they were, and they still are thinking about doing like a, a museum of the restoration. So we gave them like beauty shots of the schools that they could use. And after we did that, um, they gave us a lot more access. I mean, to the point where we had a, um, a motorcycle in the hallways, like we built wood ramps and we were driving a motorcycle, like this great um, woman that just helped us out. and. Uh, a knockoff Harley Davidson, and I'd be sitting on the back shooting in slow motion, and uh, things like that. I mean, I could never imagine that happening here in the states. And so, as far as it, we were on our own, as far as getting in and out of the country with all of our like eighty-pound lights and things. But uh, once we were there, they were very giving. Question right here. Uh, just curious about all the archival materials that you were able to show, which was amazing. Well, I think, I mean, out of the two big challenges we had, I think the, the first was how do we portray these schools like on a two-dimensional plane? But then the, the one that took so long to really be able to do was to recreate this kind of, this time, other than from the, the talking heads. And it, I mean, it took years and years, uh, some of the footage is from archival houses just doing research. Uh, Alyssa had a lot of people who helped out, and it's amazing what Alyssa found as well. I mean, we were all just like searching, and then... Can you elaborate, was that archival footage coming from within Cuba or other uh, sources? That part was just from all over, but then, uh, but then from being down in Cuba and visiting, over months of being there, we met uh, like Fidel's personal filmmaker of the last 20 years, and just randomly became his friend. And uh, we weren't sure until... You could have become anyone's friend. It just worked out just that worked way. Very lucky. 
So we did like kind of a trade, like we showed him some After Effects type stuff, and in return we'd get these unmarked envelopes showing up in New York with, you know, one time it's a film canister that smelled of vinegar, and we don't know what it is, and we put up the transfer, and that's all the black and white footage of the painters, the dancers, everything that looks great is from this degrading film. And this is the first time that we're actually telling the story because uh, his name is Roberto Chile, and he's an incredibly talented photographer and filmmaker who's been following Fidel around the world for the past 25 years. And um, when he gave us this footage, we wanted to make sure that we used it in a way that he would approve of, that wouldn't also put him in any jeopardy. Um, and so he saw the film in Havana, and we asked him, so what'd you think? Is it, you know, did we do justice to all of your generosity? And he said, just buy me some chocolates when I'm in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a yes. And, and he's, he was just thrilled with the film and thought that Fidel comes across, in his opinion, quite well. Yeah, like, yeah, Fidel talking, that's all from things he'd shot. So that was, his assistants pulled that from their personal archives. So that we didn't get until a couple years ago. And that again showed up in like, an unmarked DV camp. We don't know what it is. <laughs> Fidel talking about the schools, which is great. Uh, how did you navigate the complicated politics? Uh, this, and, you know, you chose to end on this note about the, the school not having funding. You know, did you think about uh, talking about the the, the aspect of, of a blockade uh, being an impediment to funding? Um, I think that as far as navigating the politics, we wanted to. Um, I think the original vision with the story was that the schools and the stories of these men do function as a metaphor on some level for the story of the revolution. And what's compelling to us about that metaphor is that it doesn't fall into either or of the usual stereotypical sides of the Cuba issue. In fact, it falls into both at different moments. and that. Um, was something that we thought would allow people not only to think about Cuba in a less monolithic way, but to maybe think about all, all history and works of art um, and in that way. And also for us, the constructions themselves, there was such sincerity with it, and that's something that we were always going to as our inspiration with the project as well. So that sincerity, I think, kind of transcends any of the polemics that come up in discussion to a point. And then with the end, it was it was really the latest twist in the story that's uh, guaranteed to be continued. So we were wrapping up, and then we find out the construction funding has stopped. We've already talked about the other funding situations as scenes, and we just felt it would be more powerful instead of trying to put like a face and make this new scene of a new ending. Let's just do it as a car, and I think that keeps it abstract enough that you know it shows the possibilities that are guaranteed to come one way or another for the schools. Time for one or two more questions in the back there. Yeah, um, the uh, artists are such important characters along with the school and the nature of um, all that you've shown as an inspiration. Can you give us a post-mortem on uh, all the main architects that are your main characters in the film and were they able to see the film with you in Cuba? Also, well, um, they, they all saw the film in Los Angeles. We premiered this in June and we were able to get all three architects to those screenings. So that was great. They got a standing ovation. It was the first time they were getting such massive like public recognition. And uh, we were able to organize some gallery shows around them, some uh, kind of round table discussions that they were able to be a part of, which was really excellent. Um, I think that's that was the only screening where all three were together. And then... Uh, at, LA film, at the Los Angeles Film Festival, that was. And then in Havana, um, two out of the three architects were there. Vittorio came from Milan, and Roberto lives in Havana. Um, but what was, the, and they, they had, a, I mean, Vittorio and Roberto both said they enjoyed it more while watching it in Havana, um, as you can imagine. And so that meant a lot to us. And, and then some of the other artists were there too. Augusto Rivero, Mirta Ibarra, all, the, all of the, um, cast of the choir that you see in the film were there and so it was it was special I think for them for the architects Vittorio and Roberto to share that moment and of course Ricardo Porro called us the second we got back to New York and went how did it go how did it go um, and he had already heard from people in Cuba because it gets around really fast um, they've actually been doing uh, screenings in Cuba they just had one I think a week ago and the last I heard there was a great debate afterwards which I think Alyssa knows more about but yeah. That's for the bar, I guess. I'm very excited to hear about that. <laughs> Your website is unfinishedspaces.com. Dot com. Dot com. Uh.
Thank you very much for coming. Thanks especially to Ben and Alyssa.